My next guest is a longtime NFL quarterback with the Patriots, Chiefs, as well as several other franchises. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matt Castle. Matt, how's everything going for you? It's going great, buddy. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. Appreciate it. So what do you, so with off season really hasn't been anything football for the past couple of weeks. What have you been kind of doing to kill time? You know what? I've been on an epic journey with the family. This year was the year that we road tripped it. So we went from Nashville. We got a bus. We went up through the Badlands. We did the Badlands, Mount Rushmore, a place called Crazy Horse. We did uh, Grand Tetons, Yellowstone, Montana, and now we're in uh, California. So it's been an epic summer for the Castle family, to say the least. That's awesome. That's awesome. Are you, are you, are you longing for football to return? I know mid-February I was ready for the season to start. and Obviously, we got a, what, six more, seven more weeks? So something like that, six or seven more weeks. I'm always, you know what, as a football player, you're just kind of regimented. Even when after you retire, I've been out of the game. This was going into my third year now not playing. But it, it, you get ramped up and you get excited. The enthusiasm that goes along with getting ready for a football season and the start of a football season is always exciting. So I'm, I'm fired up to get it, get it going again. So I want to ask you, so obviously you spent a, a lot of your time with New England. They went out and grabbed a brand new quarterback in the first round this year. What are your expectations for Mac Jones? You know, I'm excited about Mac Jones, obviously coming from Alabama, being with Steve Sarkeesian, who was, I, I was actually, he was my quarterback coach in college as well, which is pretty crazy to think about. But, you know, coming from a Saban program right at Alabama and to see what he went through, his resiliency, his mental toughness, you know, playing behind Hurts, playing behind Tua, but then finally capitalizing on his opportunity speaks volumes of the type of player that he is and and became even throughout throughout the adversity that he faced and what he did his senior year and now the New England Patriots were able to pick him up at 15 not have didn't have to move up in the draft to get him which is an amazing opportunity for them and, and you know what my expectations are high for Mac Jones at the same time I know that he has time to develop which is nice for him because it's a very complex system look I grew up in that system uh, a lot goes into the terminology the run checks the in-game adjustments, there's a lot put, a lot of emphasis put on the quarterback to get you into the right plays. So there's going to be a steep learning curve, and it's going to be quick. Now, everybody talks about this competition coming up between Cam Newton and Mac Jones and Camp, but the fact of the matter is there's just such a finite period of time, right? There's only so many reps that can go around to these guys, and at some point, and I, and I know that New England Patriots and Coach Belichick and Josh McDaniels know this, you have to really focus – um, focus your your decision on who you're going to start to get those guys the reps to get them a rapport with those new new players that they brought in this off season. Do you think they'll let them wear fifty the whole year? Because that, that's amazing. What'd you say? Let them, you think they'll let them wear that jersey number fifty? Because it looks amazing in mini camp, and I wish they'd let them wear it throughout the season. I I do too. It would be amazing to see a quarterback step under center with a fifty on. I I, I don't think that's going to happen, but it would be pretty interesting if it did. How much longer do you think Belichick wants to stick around with New England? You think he wants to you see know, this through? Right. You know what? I think that he wants to see the rebuild go through. Obviously, with Tom leaving last year and there was a, a, a very big rebuilding curve, they, they didn't have a lot of cap space to go out and spend money on free agency. So they were depleted at the wide receiver position in particular after Julian went down. But then you saw what they did this offseason over – $170 million worth of acquisitions this offseason in terms of going out, get guys like Hunter Henry, Johnny Smith, Kendrick Bourne, uh, Nelson Aguilar. All these guys are going to help build that offense and, and help to produce more, more, more production because that's where they lacked last year. And then on the other side of the ball, they went out and did the same thing. You know, Matt Judon, they bring, bring him at the defensive end position. They've got a pretty stable secondary. So as long as you get good quarterback play, which I think Cam was still learning the system and everybody wants to point the finger at him last year and say, well, if he was just better, well, the fact of the matter is, look, I played that position. You're coming in. You, you don't, you have a trunk, Trump. I mean, excuse me. You have a sm um, smaller off season because he wasn't able to get it into it on time. You have to learn a brand new system, COVID restrictions. Then he gets COVID. All these different factors came in to why they didn't have the production that they did, but I expect big things this year. Um, with, um, all the acquisitions, when free agency was started getting going and all of a sudden when they're announcing every signing and it's going Patriots, 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 Patriots. Right. Was that a shock to you? Did you think it was a mistake? What was your mindset? Well, I was, I was a little bit blown away. Usually they're active in free agency, but not like they were. And that just speaks to what the mentality is for that organization to Bill Belichick. He knew what they had to do and they had the money to go out and spend. And that's what you want to do. And you, what you want to see from your franchise is to go out and say, look, 
We are at a competitive disadvantage last year. We have to upgrade our personnel in order to be successful to get back to where we need to be. We have to spend money. And he did it. And that's what I love about it. And I was a little bit shocked that, I mean, not only, you know, John U. Smith, but then Hunter Henry. And I was like, both these guys signed. I mean, these are two premier tight ends in the league, you know, and then to just keep the keep the uh, momentum going. And, and, and I think guys also in free agency recognize that, look, money speaks, but at the same time, they start to say, look, we've got an opportunity where we've got a good cast of characters coming in here and it'll be a good situation for us. Do you expect Stefan Gilmore on the roster week one? I do. I expect uh, Stefan Gilmore on the roster week one. I mean, the fact of the matter is the way that the CBA is set up nowadays and understanding that those dynamics and how much potential money you could lose uh, I don't know if any player is really willing to do that and put their foot in the ground. He's got one year left on his deal. He got hurt nine games into the season last year. And so he's not, and he just said that he wasn't maybe fully healthy yet. So I don't know where his bargaining chip is coming from. He's a great player. They're definitely better with, with him on the field than without him. And at the same time, they understand that, look, he, they could maybe make him happy and offer him another two-year deal. But at the end of the day, if you go out and you ball out again this year, there's going to be a lot of organizations that are going to pay you that premier cornerback money, which is 18 to 20 million, but which wasn't there when he signed his six year deal, you know, six years ago. How far off are they from Buffalo to you? I think Buffalo is trending in the right direction. I love what Sean McDermott has done and Josh Allen, the way that he's um, been just played last year, his development. I, I love that they were able to keep Matt Mulana. Uh, on that team at the linebacker position and it's a team that's playing with a tremendous amount of confidence with a lot of young guys that have now been playing together for a few years they bring in Emmanuel Sanders this offseason so they've got um, a, a great uh, they've got a great organization there they've got they're going in the right direction so I, I think that they're they're not there yet but if they can get Cam on board and he starts playing consistently I mean they can compete with anybody in this league. What what, do you, what is your prediction for their their 2021 season for New England? Oh, you know what? I, I believe that they'll go out and win 10 plus games. I, I, I do believe that because, look, being in that building, understanding the mix and how they coach those players and put them in a great position to be successful. When you put that much talent in, in the building, Josh McDaniels will figure out a way to make them successful on the defensive side of the ball, the genius that. Bill Belichick is and now he's got all the different personnel groups and the, I mean it just becomes so dynamic and what the, what they're trying to show you the blitz packages and everything uh, I believe it's pretty easy to say that they can get back pretty quickly then I want to flip over to the Chiefs as you, you spent a couple of years over there um, Super Bowl didn't go as planned they made some moves along the offensive line obviously had some uh, capital in the draft what do you, do you like the moves they made to kind of rebound for this year I love that. I mean, with Fisher and Schwartz, you know, at the end of the year being out and then moving on from them, but then going out and getting Orlando Brown Jr. from the Ravens, that was huge. Bringing in Joe Tooney from the Patriots. I mean, that's really what they need to do was fortify that line because if they protect Patrick Mahomes, I mean, we all, we all know, I mean, what a special player he is. And then not only that, he's surrounded by guys like Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, McCole Hardman. I mean, they were able to get Robinson and re-sign him as well. So, they're, they're going to have all the weapons that they had at their disposal last year. Now, if they can sure up that offensive line, keep that offensive line healthy, I mean, they're going to be just as explosive and exciting of a team to watch as they have been in the past. And then flipping over to Tampa, how much longer does Tom have? You know what? He always said he wanted to play until 45. And, and I, you know, I, I've talked to him, here, you know, sparingly over the last few months, and he's enjoying the offseason. But I mean, the guy's a competitor, and I, I believe that in his mindset, he's like, if I can still play at a high level like we saw last year and still execute and give my team an opportunity to win without seeing the dramatic fall off that you see with a lot of quarterbacks late in their career, um, he'll, he'll continue to play. But again, he's going to have to convince his wife and children of that as well. You know how that goes with as a family man. I know that it gets to a point where it's like, OK, honey, you've accomplished everything that anybody could ever accomplish. So. Uh, it's time to refocus. So I, I would say one to two more years, to be honest with you. And one, one other question about Tom, what do you see him doing after football? You know what? He's got so many different interests and he, everything, everything from real estate 
to different endeavors. He started his own nutritional brand and yeah. obviously fitness program. And so he, he does stuff like that. But I also believe that at some point he'll try to get into the ownership side of things. It's just kind of like an Elway situation, you know what I mean? Where he wants to be involved and stay in, with the game, but from that perspective. Do you see him in the booth at all? Mm, no, I don't see Tom in the booth. I, I just, I don't see it just the way that he's played and, and he's always been great with the media, but at the same time, I, I don't believe that he'll be a guy that goes and tries to grind his, grind his way through the media and do that kind of stuff. I think he'll have his presence in the media, very similar to what Peyton does, maybe some fun shows here and there, but not to the extent of going into the booth. Interesting. And I want to ask you about USC. How would you end up there? USC, you know what? I was getting recruited. It was my sophomore, junior year. I was starting to play some good football. And then all of a sudden the recruit, recruiting process started. And that's always exciting for a young kid, right? You get these letters in the mail. They're all, you know, a fit, official letter stamp from the school. And they, it's, pretty, it's pretty similar. Probably everybody gets them, right? But then the coaches start coming out and they start talking to you. And so I talked to Tennessee. The uh, Tennessee volunteers were really good at the time. UCLA, Miami, Hurricanes. But USC was in my own backyard. I thought I'd have an opportunity to play early there, which obviously didn't come to fruition for me. But at the same time, it was uh, it was a great spot, great history. Um, and, and so that's why I picked USC at the time. Since you, you, brought, you brought up you, you didn't get that much playing time. Did you, did you even consider maybe transferring to somewhere where they let you start from the get-go? Right. You know, I thought about it. So when I committed to USC, um, Carson Palmer was going to be a true sophomore. And then at, the, at that point, about three games in the season, he got hurt. So it set him back into a redshirt. But everybody anticipated him leaving early because he's such a talented player, right? And so I thought, okay, I'll come in, I'll redshirt, maybe redshirt freshman, sophomore, I'll get my opportunity. Well, I, I mean, it was my opportunity. My redshirt junior year was to compete against Matt Leinhart. And we went through the whole offseason. We were back and forth. And really, it was a week before the Auburn game that Pete Carroll called me and said, hey, look, we're going to start start Matt Leinart to, to start the season. But if there's any hiccups whatsoever, you're going in. And so it was somewhat of a catch 22, right? Yes, I, I could potentially transfer, but they didn't have the transfer portal, portal, portal rules. That's a tough word at times that they do <laughs> now. Right. So I would have had to sit out a season or go to a division one double A school or something like that. And I was literally four months away from my degree from USC, which was important to me. So I said, let's stick it out. Well, Leinard had no hiccups. We had a really good team, and obviously the, he, he went out and won the Heisman Trophy that first year. So, I mean, I guess they made the right decision. I always told myself, they should give me like a small little Heisman. I, I felt like I competed pretty hard in practice. What was Carson telling you when you were obviously kind of waiting for your opportunity like to, to kind of keep you motivated and keep you ready? You know what? It, there's got to be a level of self-motivation when you're a backup quarterback and grinding to get on the field. You know, it can't be always somebody giving you the pickup. And the minute you start hanging your head and, and giving in to the frustration and giving into the adversity, uh, honestly, it just takes away from you to continue to compete at a high level. And so I was always one of those self-motivated people that was able to deal with adversity in my own way. And what I did was I just really worked harder and tried to find opportunities in different ways. I played I played tight end on that team. I caught balls at the receiver position. I played special teams in the Rose Bowl. I was on the hands team. I just found out ways to contribute, right? And then my junior year, I, there was a level of frustration and disappointment not being able to be, you know, what you envisioned yourself to be. So I went out and played baseball, got out of spring ball, played baseball for a year, had a great time doing that at USC. I have a lot of great friends from that experience. But then at the end of the day, went back and said, I'm going to finish how I came in as a quarterback and was a backup. And, and I, I had an opportunity to get into quite a few games because we we're blowing people out. You know, we had a great team. But it really, my opportunity, everything that I did from that point, my opportunity came down to that one pro, um, pro day where they didn't even know that I was on. The, they're like, who are you? I was like, I'm Matt Castle. I'm a quarterback, my senior. They're like, okay, well, uh, get in there. I, you can take the wonder leg test. And so I took the wonder leg test, did all the exercises, but it really came down to me throwing. And I, I threw the ball really well that, that day. I felt confident about what I did. And it was crazy because after that moment, like all these scouts kind of came in and said, okay, tell me your story. What's your deal? And I started to explain, you know, I've been here and I've been competing. I just haven't had that opportunity. We had two Heisman Trophy winners in front of me. 
And so they're like, well, what kind of tape do you have? I'll send, I said, I'll send you all 30 throws that I had in college or whatever it was. And then I threw, they said, can you send a spring ball? I was like, sure, I'll send you a spring ball. And then from that point on, you know, I just thought maybe I'll get an opportunity to go in as a free agency. I had some workouts and sure day, sure as day on draft day on that Sunday, I'm sitting there and I get a phone call on the last day of the draft from Scott Pioli. He said, hey, Matt, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Scott Pioli from the New England Patriots. I don't know if we're going to take a quarterback, but I want you to consider us in free agency. We'd love to have you in if we don't take you. And so seventh round rolled around and I'm watching um, and all of a sudden I get a phone call and I point to my girlfriend, who's my wife now at the time. And I was like, I, I think this is it. And because they were saying this is the New England Patriots. Hold on one second. Coach Belichick wants to talk to you. And then I point to the screen. I said, watch. And she goes, you haven't come up. And then I'm like, no, seriously, watch. And then it goes ding, 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 Matt Castle. And it was hilarious because even the commentators like Matt Castle, USC, who's this guy? Like had nothing, like had no idea because the stats aren't there. But that's what started my career, man. I, uh, they, they took a chance on me. And what a blessing it was to be able to go there, learn from a guy like Tom Brady, to be able to be mentored, to sit for three years, really understand and absorb that program. Because by the time I actually got that opportunity, as crazy as it was, I was ready to actually play. So. And I want to ask you, you got a question from your former teammate, Losa Tatupa. He said, um, what does doing the Trojan mean? Doing the Trojan. So that's a great question. My, my, my boy, Lofa Tutupu, he knows real well. So um, Pete Carroll, he is the ultimate, like, let's get, the, let, let's get it going, right? He's going to encourage you. He, he leads from a position of positivity. And so he'd get up and he'd start these chants every now and then. And so he, he'd jump up in front of the team. He's like, you know what we're going to do, guys? We're going to play Trojan football. We're going to go out there. We're going to take care of football. this time. And then, you know what we're going to do? We're going to party. We're going to do the Trojan. Come on, come on, do the Trojan. Yeah, yeah. Like he's getting it. He wanted everybody to jump up and do the Trojan. So I found it pretty funny. I've got a little bit of a sense of humor. And so one day, Coach Carroll hadn't come into the team meeting yet. And so I jumped up in front of the whole team. And I started to give the same speech, the rah-rah speech. And then I said, come on, guys. We're going to do the Trojan. And then like then Coach Carroll walked in and just blew me up. He's like, Castle, sit down. I was like, oh, man. But, I mean, the guys that were there remember it. It was pretty, pretty funny, funny circumstance. But that's what doing the Trojan means. He, he was telling me to call you Cast Dog. Did you get that a lot? That's, that's all my boys. Yeah, all, <laughs> all my best buds, they all call me Cast Dog. That's how I, that's, I guess, my nickname. It's been my nickname for a long, long time. <laughs> Um, is it true that you were roommates with both Troy Palomalo and Carson? I was, yes. We had a house, 1013. Well, and it was um, right by off the USC campus. It was Troy Palomalo. It was Carson Palmer, Kerry Colbert, Lenny Vandermeen, Malifo McKenzie, Grant Maddows. Am I missing anybody? Any of the boys? And then, um, But all those guys had played in the NFL at some point or another, some longer than the rest. But those guys, we all lived in the same house. I shared a room with Carson. Uh, Foe was in the front. I mean, it was crazy. It was a great time, though. Great house. Uh, well, what's your best Carson story? Best Carson story? Gosh. I mean, playing, uh, he's got a bunch of great Carson stories. I mean, I'll, this kind of speaks to Carson himself. But at the same time, uh, but I'll talk about when we were roommates. Let's go through, through that. He was a little bit of a messy roommate. I'm not going to lie. But so he gets drafted, right, by the Bengals. He goes first overall. Well, the next thing I know, he's got a, he's going to report to a rookie minicamp. Well, he was still living in the house, but he left all of his clothes, his bed, every shoe. He didn't take one possession with him from USC, which was comical. But this is what I was saying. It speaks to him as a person was the fact that he also picked up rent for us for like the next four months or whatever until we were out of that house. So it's like, it's not my favorite Carson story, but it speaks to Carson himself. Like, could care less about this or the other, but he takes care of his friends and his boys. He's one of the most loyal people you'll ever meet. That's awesome. And then so fast forward going back to that pro days. And after that, you get the call from New England. Before, before you got that call from Scott Pioli, did you think, all right, I'm going to have to make a roster? Were you thinking about maybe moving on from football? What were you thinking about? You know, it's funny because um, I had a decision if I was going to go play baseball again 
for my senior year because I had eligibility left yeah. or if I was going to go out for pro day. And it was always my my dream and my vision that I wanted to go out for pro day. I felt like physically I had the tool set. I just didn't have the tape and I didn't have the experience because I didn't play much. So I said I went up to my coach, Carl Smith. We called him Tater. And I said, uh, coach, thinking about going out for pro day. He's like, mm, Castle, I think you might want to think about a different profession. And I was like, oh, thanks, coach. That's super uplifting, right? So I did not take his advice. I said, you know what? I'm going to train my butt off, which that's what I, I, like I said before, that's what I know how to do. Trained my butt off, got myself ready and went out and, and said, I'm going to give it my all. And I said, after that, I didn't know, but I, I had done internships in real estate. I had done internships in finance. And so I had I had an understanding that I could go do something else, but if I didn't try it, I'd always be kicking myself. And thank God I did because it, it worked out. So you, so you you sit behind two Heisman Trophy winners at USC, and then you get drafted. And you're like, I finally get my shot, and then you're going behind Tom Brady. What was that like? It was incredible and kind of surreal at the same time, right? They're coming off a third Super Bowl victory in four years. I'm going to the defending Super Bowl champion, the New England Patriots, Bill Belichick. All, uh, to be honest with you, though, I had no idea where Boston was because I'm a West Coast guy all the way. So I'm like looking on the map going, oh, wow, that's a long flight. I'm going out here. So East Coast. But I, I walk in the first day and I remember walking in and introducing myself to Tom. And I said, hi, Mr. Brady, being respectful. Right. And he's like, don't call me Mr. Brady. You can call me Brady. You can call me Tom, whatever. Don't don't call me Mr. Brady. But what was unbelievable about it was yes I was intimidated I came from a big program like USC I played with guys that are in the pros and I and played with Heisman Trophy but this is a whole different animal when you get into a building and so I just kept my head down mouth shut and went to work you know and I I asked the dumb questions when I probably shouldn't but you, you know they say don't always ask those questions because you never know but Tom could not have been nicer he uh he took me under his wing. We pretty much throughout that off first off season, I was there. We started to work out together and push each other and built a bond and built a friendship. And from that point on, really, it was me just taking everything in, watching, at, listening to the questions that he would ask right during the meetings. And why, why was he asking that about the particular, you know, the backer shifted over or the rotational front and what he's trying to, to like just figure out when, when he's, devising a plan of how to attack a defense. And so all those questions were were unbelievable for me to sit there and listen to and start to understand because I just took notes and started to understand how to train yourself as a professional quarterback and how to prepare for games. And he was meticulous about his note taking. He's been meticulous about going through the game plan uh, and then also making subtle adjustments even the day of the game. He'd sit there and we'd sit in a quarterback meeting with Josh McDaniels and he'd say, hey, do we want this guy run this route or do we want this guy run this route? And so it was just an amazing time for me to learn. And then after that, you know, again, it was going into my fourth season when and he got hurt in the first quarter of the fourth season of my fourth season. And I was able to go in and it was baby steps early on because they didn't know how much I could really you know, handle the entirety of the offense at that point. But within three, four games, we started to roll and started to really understand that, okay, I'm capable of running, you know, the, 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 different, the different checks, the run checks, the get us in and out of plays, giving me the, the responsibility to be able to check out of certain passes and signal stuff. So um, it was pretty cool. But if it wasn't that fourth year, it might have been that third year, but it was great that it happened when it did because I was able to develop and watch and understand how to play within that system. Was, was Tom from afar kind of giving you advice and tips of how to kind of carry the offense? He was, but, you know, to his credit, he also allowed me to grow and be my own leader. You know, sometimes in those situations when the, the quarterback or your franchise quarterback, especially a guy like Tom, is always around, people are calling, kind of always looking at him still for leadership. And because he went and did, did a surgery in California, yes, we talk all the time and he'd give me, you know, he'd say a hey, great game, or he always call me right before, or right after, whether good or bad. And we'd have a discussion, you know, what I saw in certain plays, but at the same time, because he was in California, it allowed me to grow and, and go through this maturation process of leadership with these guys and start to see that I have a voice and I'm my own leader. And so, that was pretty special for me because otherwise I don't know if I would have gotten the same response from the players 
if Tom was sitting there over my shoulder every day or in meetings and watching and them asking questions, you know what I mean? Do you ever get you to try avocado ice cream? No, I'm not, I'm, I'm okay with avocado ice cream. <laughs> I know what ice cream tastes like and avocado is not part of my, that on my menu. Well, when you were first got there, was he eating normal foods or was he starting to kind of get into like all the plant-based stuff? Well, he was always healthy with his approach, you know, from his nutritional approach. He always um, would eat healthy, a lot of greens, a lot of this, but he would have his meats and everything else, uh, you know, back then, but not to the same extent. Like I would go get a double cheeseburger for lunch. He'd be like, you know, something healthy, a piece of chicken, salad, grapes, nuts. Like he was always on top of it. But I, as he transitioned into a different mode and I haven't read his book, I'm sorry, Tom, I didn't read your book yet. Um, but that's probably why he's still playing and I'm not, <laughs> but, but I enjoy food, but, but he's always taking care of great care of himself. And that's speaks to his longevity in the league as well. What was it like when you got traded to Kansas city? You know, it was a whirlwind because that whole season, you know, it, it was like, I got done with the season. I like, I remember getting off the bus, going home. It was late night after we won Buffalo. We found out we didn't get into the playoffs at 11, five. And I picked up some Taco Bell for my wife and I, we, I get home, we pop a little bottle of champagne to celebrate the ending of the season. And it was just like, what just happened? Right. And then as that off season started to go, I got franchised by the New England Patriots because Tom had a little this, that, and the other with his, his knee, you know, some, some concerns. But then as we started to see that Tom was going to be healthy, I figured I was going to get traded. And I didn't, I didn't really anticipate it being the Kansas City Chiefs, to be honest with you, even though Scott Pioli, who I had a relationship with from New England, went there. But when it all uh, actually all was said and done, I got a phone call from Bill and he said, Matt, I want to thank you for what you did. You know, I've got a lot of respect for you, but you, we did trade you to the Kansas City Chiefs. And I was like, OK, you know, here's the next chapter. At the same time there's a lot that goes into to when you get traded, you're now the franchise guy and you're moving to a brand new city. Again, you, you have to build that relationship, the rapport with your team. That's now looking at you as the figurehead. And there's a lot of responsibility with that comes along with this, especially when you go to a team that was struggling in the prior years, we were in a rebuilding process. So I knew it was going to be a difficult task to turn this thing around and get it going in the right direction. What was it like when you, when you went to the pro bowl? It was incredible. It was a remarkable accomplishment. You know, I set a goal early on that year that I, I wanted to, you know, win, win double digit games, make the playoffs, you know, go as far as we possibly, obviously the ultimate goal is always to do that. But after the first year that we had there, that was a, we were on the struggle bus, we won four games. I said, let's get into double digits. Let's make playoffs win the AFC West. And that's what we were able to do. And then to get the honor of going to the pro bowl was just, icing on the cake and it was something that I kind of sat there and I was just like I just got a phone call to go to the Pro Bowl and I hugged my wife and you know a lot of hard work went into it and it's obviously not all me I had a lot of great help along the way with you know all the my teammates Jamal Charles Dwayne Bow went to the Pro Bowl that year he was incredible my offensive line did a great job so I give credit to those guys but I got to go and be at the pinnacle of you know pro sports which is go sit there next to Peyton Manning and and Philip Rivers and Drew Brees and Ray Lewis and Ed Reed and all these guys, Matt Ryan was there and you get to hang out and, and with your peers, you know, and, and that to me was uh, a special moment that I'll never forget. I flew my family out, my brothers, my sister, her, my, my wife's family, just to be there and experience it. Cause it's so unique, you know, to be there amongst greatness. And so I always will covet that moment for sure. Now, let's go one more question for you before I let you go. Um, you were a late round draft pick. This year we had, what, four or five guys going the first round. Are there any guys that went past the first round that you've been keeping an eye on that you think people should do? Oh, that's a great question right there. Um, you know what? I can't think of anybody's name off the top of my head, to be honest with you. I, I didn't, after, after the draft happens, I kind of turn the page and start to move on to get ready for season. And I know that there's guys out there that I should have absolutely 100% been looking at and been like, this is the guy. But I'm sure that there will be guys throughout the, like whether it's second, third, fourth round, fifth round, it's always remarkable. I love watching, you know, the, the process of the season and watching some of these young, young guys who come in their later round draft picks that make a tremendous impact. 
on their team. And so I can't pinpoint one guy for you right now. And you can cut this whole thing out if you want to, but okay. um, yeah, but the fact of the matter is, you know, it, that's exciting for me to watch these young guys, but I don't have one name for you. And then just one last quick one, uh, another USC guy uh, switched teams this off season. Sam Darnold Jonick is now with the Carolina Panthers. What are your expectations for him this year? You know what? I like Sam, Sam Darnold. And I, I know that, He's had a tough go with the Jets, and, and I, but I think he's highly talented. He's a smart kid. And sometimes what happens is you just need a fresh start, you know. And I think going there with Matt Rule and Joe Brady and the, the weapons that they have on the outside, I like, I like what they did. They have a young team, and I think he'll fit that system very well. And so it, it'll be remarkable to watch him and see how he does. But I think he's going to have a lot of success there it, with a fresh start, Without, without the New York media and everybody and all the expectations, there's going to be expectations if you play quarterback. He knows that. But he's already been through some really tough adversity through, early, through the early time in his career. And if he can learn from that, build on that, he'll have a lot of success because he's got the talent. We've all seen it. There's been yeah. – but it's just got to become more consistent. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one of the questions really have for you. Are you on social media? Can people check you out? Are you on social media at all? I'm starting a social media. Uh, I'm not a big social media guy, but I'm starting social media. I'll be up on Twitter running sooner than later. Awesome. Awesome. I do appreciate you taking time. This is a blast. It means a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it, brother. Have a great one.